Um, but I'm here to talk, uh, as David mentioned, I've been, um, had a, a pretty diverse career in marketing and analytics, uh, dating back to Google um, in the mid aughts, um, uh, to Ally Financial, where we launched an online bank, uh, to joining David at Comcast, and now in my tenure at FS Investments. And what's been interesting about the, the career projection or career path I've had is that I've been um, doing different or addressing different business cases using kind of the same skill sets uh, in from digital marketing and analytics pretty much at every stop. So I've you know been privileged to, to try my hand uh, and plan my trade in, in very different uh, scenarios but have uh, you know come through to find some things that I found kind of work everywhere you go. And one of those is challenging assumptions. So I wanted to you know, give you guys a little background on sort of my approach to this and, and how you might apply this in your business. So I think there's, there's kind of three parts of this that I, if I step back and think about, uh, one is principle of destruction, which I'll get to in a second, then sort of harassing assumptions or why they need to be challenged. And finally, you know, you're going to hear this in, in many of the presentations today, but culture is a huge part of, of being effective in any analytics department. Um, department. So, you know, this is pretty much, um, you know, if we're fortunate enough to, to be nearing the end of the maturity cycle in the analytics, we're forecasting, forming product, hopefully setting strategy. What we're doing is we're creating. And as much as many of us got here um, through our love and admiration of facts and truth, um, analytics in and of itself isn't, isn't an end. It's doing something with those facts, uncovering opportunities uh, for creation. So, you know, this is, this is true, um, you know, it, ancient scholars uh, in religious texts to empiric, empirical scientific theories like the rock cycle, uh, the only constant really is change. That means that, you know, every other assumption um, will be undermined at some point, most likely. And so if you're looking for opportunities to apply analytics in, your, in, a, in an open-ended environment, um, one of the best places you can look for um, is, is these assumptions. Um, a couple of other points here is, you know, don't get, don't get, s avoiding pride of authorship is, is my way of saying, don't get married to your, your own assumptions and, you know, be careful to consider them when you are looking at anything, right? Your own models are full of them. So just make sure that you're, you know, uh, looking at those things and then, you know, be persistent with this. Um, a lot of times, you know, patience is another virtue in this. So here's assumptions are, are heuristics, which are psychological uh, tools that human beings use um, to quickly get to a decision. Basically, it's you know, a practical method. It takes advantage of shortcuts, uh, rules of thumb, trial and error, educated guess. A lot of times uh, the experience um, several times has changed hands, um, but the point is they're useful in an environment where people don't want to spend the time being analytical. And a lot of C-suites or middle management players are, are sort of like that. I say they're true-ish. Um, it's because they were true at one time, and that doesn't mean they're still true today. Um, and in fact, most of them, other than the change assumption, being the only one that's you know, eternal, uh, the rest of them probably will change. It's just a matter of when. They're sticky in that people tend to fall in love with their own assumptions or they find comfort in them. Um, because it's, it's, a, it's a safe place for them. Assumptions are also vulnerable, as I've just said. Again, I think all of them decay over time. Um, you should be you know, paying attention to things where you hear thin justifications or something that suggests there really isn't a business case uh, because, or I don't know why we do it that way, or foregone conclusions like, I'm not giving you any justification, I'm just saying this is something we need. And then a lot of cases, uh, particularly earlier in my career, I was finding myself having to justify de decisions after the fact. You know, well, I don't know why we did, or can you find some numbers that make this look good? So those are all places where uh, you have, if you have the opportunity to dig a little deeper, you could probably expose an assumption that will you know, prove to be a, a fruitful place for you to make some positive change. The, the best way to challenge uh, assumptions is uh, to ask good, naive questions. So, you know, children, uh, first timers uh, or new uh, hires at, a, at an organization um, oftentimes are very effective at this because they don't have the baggage of the culture or, or you know, they haven't sort of internalized some of the assumptions that they didn't even think to question or you may not question several years in. 
But um, when I worked at Google uh, under Sheryl Sandberg's organization, she was big on mentoring people and gave this advice about asking why or being prepared to answer that question or presenting some information. But you know, people should ask why three times until they can either understand why something makes sense or understand that they can't understand. And if you get to that end of, of uh, you know, asking the, the three times, you know, you probably have found an assumption that uh, doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, and you can, you know, feel free to start to poke um, and understand, you know, what it is you might be able to help uh, change in the situation. I want to provide a couple of case studies here too, um, along with some, and these are from my career. Um, this is uh, during my time at Comcast. There was a show called Scandal, which debuted in April of 2012, and it finished its first season uh, with middling ratings. So this is um, 8.2 million average viewers per episode for an overall rank of the 62nd most popular show on TV. By the fall of that year, so most people don't realize, but a, a TV season on, on cable has two seasons, really. It's or a year has two seasons, spring and fall. Season two, it, it was doing even worse. And this had, uh, this was puzzling some of the ABC executives who we were working with at Comcast. Um, they had thought that this was a good show and they had a compelling star in Kerry Washington. And uh, by the end of this time, season two, um, the show was on the brink of cancellation. So at Comcast at the time, we were really focused on video on demand or VOD and um, noticing obviously with Netflix ramping up at the time to become you know, the juggernaut that it is today that people were, were very interested in on-demand consumption, watching when it was convenient to them. And we suggested to ABC that they make the entire back catalog of Scandal available on demand and they laugh, They almost laughed us out of the room, but their assumption was that, you know, VOD, this will kill linear ratings. And everything at the time then was about uh, saving linear ratings for advertising revenue for ABC. And, you know, they just didn't think, um, you know, they thought that, you know, putting it on, on VOD would just enable people to watch it whenever they wanted to and it would kill linear ratings. Um, but we prevailed on them with some conditions to make it palatable as a test. Comcast at the time was something like 20% market share for all TV viewing in the United States. And uh, with some things like embedding advertising in the VOD assets and you know, making sure that fast forward wouldn't work in those scenarios, we were able to let ABC um, give us the entire back catalog of scandal after these two seasons. Um, and we put those up on VOD and then we're able to demonstrate to them um, through our own analytics that there was this accretive audience where the audience built basically in the run-up to the live showing of the next uh, show on ABC in real time. And in fact, the VOD audience built up to such a point and so quickly that they then started watching the show in linear on, on live TV. And the ratings of, of Scandal uh, started to improve dramatically um, when it came back on the air in the spring of season two. So then seasons three and four went on to achieve pretty spectacular ratings of 12 and 12.7 million viewers respectively, which was enough to rank this show uh, in the top 20 on TV in 2013, 2014, and 2015. So again, here's a, here's a situation where you know, we, we suggested against conventional wisdom to try something a little bit different, a little bit scary, but we're able to uh, achieve a pretty remarkable result by doing that. Now I work at uh, FS Investments. Um, we have uh, a, a very different business model. Um, we are a B2B sales, uh, or first of all, we're a fund manager and a distribution uh, network. And we work through financial advisors uh, in the United States to, um, distribute our funds to their investors. And we're using uh, methods like, not unlike B2B sales methods, but drip marketing campaigns, a lot of uh, CRM driven uh, sales activity, marketing activity, all recorded there. And then we are working on these people over long uh, sales cycles, um, which obviously span multiple products in many years. So it's a, it's a, diff it's a different 
uh, not very immediately measurable uh, situation. Um, I've been working um, in my role where I kind of get to unify uh, data and marketing um, in the support of this distribution organization to, um, to sort of digitize this analog or multi-channel uh, sales cycle, which happens with a lot of relationships, a lot of in-person meetings, um, but also increasingly through digital touch points. And we've tried to, through, uh, through Salesforce and our marketing automation stack, create a, as much of a, a, you know, a track of measurement for all of those relationships. Entering into this environment in 2013, I came into, a, into an organization uh, that was green in its digital marketing, um, but had good leadership who, who was very uh, data-driven in their uh, way of organizing the firm. That said, they had hired a sales arm, and this was probably almost inevitable if you're looking for experienced salespeople in finance uh, who were you know, bringing relationships to the table. And early on, that makes a lot of sense because that's what you can measure or lever, uh, I'm sorry, to, uh, to you know, create sales traction right away. Um, but a lot of these folks have, a, have an old school mentality, not unlike Alec Baldwin here from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, um, but they're looking at sales as, as a relationship-driven business. Um, incidentally, they're not wrong. It's a, it's a significant part of what we see when we measure these, uh, these sales journeys from beginning to end. Um, but it's not the only thing that matters, and we can obviously help them shorten their sales cycles, uh, which is probably the most important thing we can do um, through you know, the you know, introduction of digital marketing and measuring that and optimizing it with analytics. So I wanted to just describe a, a case study where we were using, uh, proposing to use data, we set up a machine learning algorithm. We used a GPM model uh, to prioritize prospecting and sales outreach efforts. Um, and our, our proposal was to, to replace sales intuition led uh, prospecting alone. Um, and this concept was you know, pretty threatening to some of these old school sales folks who viewed this again as a relationship business and they looked at anything we were doing as an incursion on, on their way of life. Um, but we couched it as a test and uh, quietly trained our algorithm on uh, one and a half million rows of sales and marketing data and then uh, prepared an experiment where we, were, we took a thousand advisors, put them into a control and test sample and the uh, control was 500 randomly sampled advisors who were then uh, presented on a territory management system, which was basically just a way of serving leads up to our sales teams. And then uh, the test sample uh, was 500 uh, stack ranked by our GBM propensity scoring model as the most likely to trade in the next 35 days. Having you know, assumed all of the, or you know, looked at, reviewed all of the activity data that we had stored in Salesforce and other data sets behind the scenes. And uh, the test and control uh, outcomes were pretty remarkably different here. Um, the conversion rate was 6% uh, versus about 3% for uh, sales intuition. It produced 46 trades uh, over the test time frame and a sales difference immediately of $2.3 million. Um, we were then uh, pretty, pretty pleased with these results and we still had a fight on our hands. We had to take these around to a progression of decision makers all the way up to our CEO um, before we were you know, allowed to endorse this as our preferred methodology for prioritizing outreach. Um, but once we did that, we saw pretty awesome increases in top line growth and efficiency. Um, so the chart I'm showing on the, on the slide here shows the ratio of calls to sales dropping by 27%. And we found that, you know, in the, in the highest uh, band of advisors, those that had the highest propensity scores, there was almost a one-to-one -one phone call to trade uh, ratio that obviously dropped precipitously. Um, and the algorithm was better at predicting people who weren't going to trade. Um, it was pretty good at predicting people who were going to trade, but if it said they weren't going to trade, they definitely weren't going to trade. And so a big part of this was also just this you know, efficiency gain. So we saw 14% increases in prospecting conversion rate, 16% increase in cross-selling conversion rate, and a 6%, almost 6% lift in daily average sales, which amounted to about $100 million annualized. So this was a pretty uh, compelling assumption for us to challenge, and part of why I was brought into the firm, I think. So a couple of things I wanted to I just sort of touched on here is, 
is culture really is important. I was fortunate enough to walk into a situation where our executives understood uh, how important data was and it's been a pillar of what we um, have built the business around. That said, you know, in the boots on the street practice of distributing for FS investments, we don't, you know, not everyone has internalized this obviously. So when you're attacking these assumptions, um, it's pretty important in my opinion to be transparent about the fact that you're attacking the idea, not the person. Because again, people, my, myself included, we tend to form these attachments to our assumptions. You know, it's easy to, to do something like I did and say, well, you know, our model is the best model. You don't really need to worry about that again. Well, what I should actually be doing is uh, practicing what I preach and, and you know, being open to challenging my own assumptions. But if we are known for being in the business of attacking people, you're not going to get very far, even if you do have the best data. Um, because it is, at the end of the day, people that you have to convince. Um, so you have to tread with care um, when, it, when it comes to challenging assumptions. And I think something that's important you know, to, to do there is establish a culture where it's okay to disagree. And this is, this is easier said than done and something I'm, I'm continuing to work on. But I, you know, cause I found the, you know, the strongest collaborations uh, require tension. Uh, which generally means that people are care about an issue or a decision on both sides. Um, and so if you can find a way to communicate with them, that's not about the personal feelings you have, but about, you know, the mission, you can usually find that your values are aligned and you can you know, collaborate effectively. Um, and then lastly, you know, it, as, as much as you're, you know, asking uh, for accountability from people, um, you're not always going to get it but you have to be good at that because you're the one who's you know, gonna be disrupting this. You're, you're the one who's paid to think and to, to bring insights. Um, so you know, expose your rules, then play by them. Uh, don't gloat on your victories and immediately admit it when you're wrong and, and uh, be prepared to take the next steps to make things better. So with that, I realized that was pretty quick, um, but I am finished, so thank you, David. <laughs>